Welcome, everybody, to the Troubadour podcast. And today I have Jason Crawford from the Roots of Progress dot org. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. And we're going to talk about art and science and progress. And for me, I want to talk about the progress in the arts and you have the progress in the sciences. I know almost nothing about the progress in the sciences, um, but hopefully I know a little bit about the arts. And I think you know some about the arts, but a lot about the sciences. I think together we're going to have an interesting conversation about what progress is. And for me, how arts and sciences work together to continue and to keep progress going or to how it happened in the past and maybe how we can keep it going in the future, which is an important topic. So why don't you tell um, the Troubadour people how what, what you do at rootsofprogress.org or because it is called Roots of Progress, and I think you could take that in a lot of directions of what the Roots of Progress, but you've taken it in a specific direction right now. Right? Yeah. Right. So the blog is about the history of technology and industry, and more broadly, the story of human progress. Um, to me, human progress is broader than just technological and economic progress. It includes the advance of knowledge and the history of science. It also includes progress in society and government. Uh, but so far, I've been focusing on technology and industry as my, as my current focus. Um, Long-term, I tend to address those other aspects. And um, I'm looking forward to this conversation because progress in art is something I've been thinking about. Um, it's less obvious to me, or let me just say, the, the overall arc of progress that I think we see in those other three areas um, doesn't seem to play out in exactly the same way in the arts. And so I think this will be a really interesting discussion yeah i mean it's i i've had conversations with people just last week i had a conversation with somebody who didn't think there was progress in the arts at all all you had was change so you know so one we have to think about what progress means as a concept and then can it apply to the arts right like so if you went from um you know romantic style in the 19th century to like cubism like is that progress or is that just change you know, how would you define, and that is a good question in, in that particular context, like is, Cuba, you know, is surrealism progress is, and then therefore is abstract art actual progress, or is it, you know, I would call it regression, right? And so I think that that question is important. And now the, the, the broader question is, what's the relevance to humanity of this? Like, is it just a side project for humanity. Does that make sense? So like, I think what you're doing with the roots of progress and technology, there's a clearer linear exam, like a uh, way to see, Oh, look, we now have the steam engine. Here's a graph of life expectancy. That's what progress looks like. Clearly, this is clearly progress, right? We didn't have the steam engine. Now we have it. And right. we're able to do things like, I was just listening to your, stuff recently and you talk about one of the first things they used for steam engine was to take water out of mines which yep. allowed you to mine underwater or under sea level right so, yeah, so that's under, under the level of the groundwater sure so it started with pumping water out of mines then we got more efficient steam engines that could drive uh, machinery and factories for instance then we got even smaller and more efficient engines that could be put on vehicles and we got the locomotive and the steamboat um, so there was a progression. And one thing about uh, technology and econ technological and economic progress is it tends to be the easiest to measure. So we can yes. come up with things like what is the fastest that um, uh, people can move over land or over water? And we can look at speeds increasing. Yeah. We can look at total volume of passenger traffic. How much did people actually choose to move? What was the price of uh, transportation from New York to San Francisco over time? Um, you know, how, so there's all kinds of uh, metrics that we can use, a lot of them economic metrics um, and technological, you know, metrics and, and ways that you can just see uh, these, these very strong increases. Um, we, it's, that gets harder for science. Um, there are, you know, how exactly do you measure the total amount of scientific knowledge uh, right. Number of equations in textbooks. That's not exactly right. That's a very well, rough and measure. We've done more recently than ever in the history of mankind to some degree. If I, like yes, there's more, absolutely. If you just measure papers written. Yes. There's more papers written now than ever, but we, it still seems like there was something fundamental about 
Newton's discovery in Principia, right? Where um, what was it, Mathematica, Principia, or something? Like yeah, that? Principia, Mathematica. Thank you. Natural... Trying to sound smart. Na- yes, failed. Mathematical <laughs> Principles of Natural Philosophy yeah. is the... there. You go. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. have it on my shelf. I've never read it. <laughs> to be fair. Yeah, that was a watershed. Yeah. So, but you know, like that's not a the like the papers that you see today put it being put out are not on that level. Not in terms of the content. The rarely. Yeah. Or do you think there are some like on that level? Well, you know, every once in a while you get, um, you know, you get an Einstein or someone coming along with a a real breakthrough. Um, But, you know, those things, yes, those things obviously don't happen every year or even every decade. Yeah. So we're talking like century discoveries. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Now in the... had something on that level besides that? Was it Einstein? I mean, this is... So this is a good example of like measurement in the sciences. Yep. If Einstein is an improvement, are all the people around him just kind of pro- all the people after him kind of proving what he theoretically put out? Like he put out this massive thing and then people are either proving or disproving if they want to. Right. Does that make sense? Well, there's been a lot. I mean, there have been developments uh, since Einstein. Uh, okay. um, now, I'm not as familiar with the history of science as I am with uh, technology at this point, but um, a lot of things figured out in quantum physics and particle physics, a lot of so at the tiniest level. A lot of uh, more things figured out at the biggest level, cosmology, the structure of the universe, the history of the universe. Um, so there have been, there certainly have been uh, some big things. Uh, you know, I think you could argue, I don't know, I don't, I don't have a, a settled opinion on this, but it anecdotally, it feels a little maybe that that more, a, a, a higher pace of huge developments was happening in maybe the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, all of electromagnetism, I think, basically got figured out in mostly the 19th century. Um, chemistry made huge strides in the late 18th and early 19th, um, uh, well, really through the 19th century. So there were, um, you know, entire fields uh, getting established. And uh, people today are wondering, has there been some sort of a slowdown? Uh, and this yeah. is an open question in progress studies is, uh, is there a stagnation? If so, in e- scientific and or economic progress, if so, kind of what's the nature of the stagnation? How big is it and, and what's causing it? And can we, uh, you know, give things a kick and, and accelerate them again? So, OK, so let's step back real quick. And what do you see as what is progress? Sure. That will maybe help frame the, the conversation about art and science and technology. So I judge progress by a humanistic standard. What? Uh, progress is pro- uh, an advancement in anything that helps us live better, longer, happier, healthier lives, gives us more control of our environment, uh, allows us to live in peace and harmony. So progress in technology and industry is more technology, more wealth, more industrial capacity, right? more control over our environment and, and ability to do things in the physical world. Um, progress in science is more knowledge, more understanding, more and more detailed uh, physical laws and, and principles, uh, more data collected and better understanding of the data. Progress in uh, sci- uh, uh, society and government is more peace, more freedom, more universal rights, uh, more just harmony and people getting along. So do you differentiate... Okay, so I had to pick on the last one thing you just said. Do you differentiate between what many progressives might say as like universal rights and like is that where we should be heading politically in terms of giving people rights to more and more stuff like oh well so i said that very condescendingly but yeah sure i mean so now you're you're getting into more of sort of my uh you know personal kind of ideological biases i have a much more you know free market uh bias and when i talk about rights i'm mostly thinking about um, individual rights, yeah. economic rights, human rights. Uh, not... But it gets confusing with progressives, right? Because they yes, say they true. want progress, so like human rights, you know, that's how they define and understand rights. So everyone on the planet has certain rights, and including rights to food, rights to healthcare, rights to, you know, homes, housing sure. on the planet. Like every, so that, and... that seems like a progressive next step right yes and uh it's an unfortunate piece of terminology because i think that the what are uh you know termed progressive progressives in the in the political sphere are actually uh 
uh, are quite different from what has is being termed the progress movement or progress studies. Okay, so there's a. I figured there might be a difference. Yeah, and so this is just so we can get clear for people. Um, now you're not against those necessarily those things in terms of people acquiring them, but it, you know, what might because we should get to a point. Let's let me put it this way in terms of progress, where everybody on the planet does have a house or a place uh, that they can live in. Where, and more people. So we have seven plus billion people. So progressives say everyone should have a house. And we would, you would agree with that, I would imagine. Right? Everyone should have food. Sure. I mean, all the, right. those are desirable outcomes. Yes. Outcomes. Um, part of what I, the reason I'm interested in studying the history and the nature and causes of human progress is to say, if those are the outcomes we want, let's look at what actually creates them. Yes. Um, and look, look at how we actually got here because we've come a very long way. Um, part of what I want to do in my work is just help people understand and appreciate how far we have come. Uh, I think a lot we take a lot of progress today for granted, and we yeah. don't uh, we don't even we're not vividly clear on how much better we have it than our ancestors, um, and we don't realize actually I think how much of a historical anomaly that was. Yeah. How much uh, actually for thousands, really tens of thousands of years, progress was very slow overall. And really, there's been an explosion of progress in all three of the areas I mentioned, in technology, uh, in science, and in, in our forms of government. There's been huge leaps in the last 300 years or so, let's say. And uh, I want everybody to be more aware of that, to be more appreciative of it, and to understand that this is a gift from our ancestors that we should, um, that, that we should be grateful for. And that at the same time, we should be thinking about how do we all play a part in moving this forward and continuing uh, to make progress. Yeah. So, th I mean, this is opens up some several questions. I'm trying to get to the art thing at some point. And I have, but I, I want to touch on this maybe to flush out for listeners some of your mission before we get into that deeper. So, the one, one issue is um, maybe we got it good enough, and all we really need to do is help the people that, you know, don't have it quite, you know, yet get it, which goes to what you were saying in terms of figuring out what caused it. Because if you understand what caused the progress we have, just let that happen there, right? Or, or help them happen with progress in sub-Saharan Africa or, or, you know, some poor parts of the world. And that makes sense, right? Like, that's what we want progress-wise. Yeah, sure. I mean, so you can think of one form of progress is uh, pushing forward the frontier, innovation, doing new things, new inventions, new technologies, uh, new uh, understanding and science, things that no one has ever created, right? Yeah. Another, another form of progress is more distribution. So take something that's been invented or a certain standard that's been set set somewhere and make it available to you know most of the world. Uh, both of those, in my opinion, are important. Both of those are forms of progress. Both of those are things we should think about, study, look at how they happened. Um, and there are different mechanisms for each. Um, okay, so... I mean, there's so much I want to get into with that. Like, <laughs> did you see Bill Gates's documentary that was on Netflix recently? I, I have not yet. I'm very okay. interested in it. Yeah, because I, there's, you know, one of the things they were doing was how to uh, bring, sana like, bring toilets to places in Africa that don't rely on the infrastructure that we have. So, like, it goes this because it's again toilets are something progress that we don't think about. Yep. Right. Like, how does do our toilets work? How where does this go? How is it all processed? Right. Like, if you look at just 100, 150 years ago in London, they were throwing poop out of windows. Right. Like, that's yep. just that's it, not that far it, away. It, it ran yes, you and know, it ran open through cobblestone streets, yeah. and there were yeah. cesspools within the city. I yeah. actually just wrote uh, my my latest recent blog post was on improvements in sanitation and how those led to improved health, reductions in uh, in infectious disease rates. Let me, I'm going to pop this on the screen for people. Yeah. So you can go to uh, rootsofprogress.org, Draining at, the Swamp. Draining the Swamp was the okay. most recent uh, blog, yeah, so long-form blog post that I wrote. It's very and, detailed, yep. lots of information, and it's about that, that idea of draining. Yeah. Which I haven't read, so I didn't do that on purpose. Well, so I started looking into um, the history of uh, mortality rates. So looking at some of the... Uh, research and data on how have mortality rates reduced over time. They've come way, way down. And if you look at that and then you start to correlate it with uh, technological improvements and uh, you know changes in, in society, in the world, and in how we live uh, that might have caused that, 
I think you find that sanitation efforts actually had a big part to play. And yeah, water I mean, and sewage are, are a big part of that, especially in the late 1800s and, and early 1900s. I mean, there, there's definitely a lot we take for granted. Absolutely. And it's um, it, it can be maddening that we take it for granted, a lot of the stuff that we take. I mean, just like what I'm doing for my for making money is, you know, taking stuff that people have spent 100 years perfecting and improving and making super cheap. Like this stuff is relatively cheap. Like it's incredible how affordable. Like all this equipment all this we're equipment using. All this equipment is, yep. and, you know, and how it relies, you know, it's sure like I'll complain about technology. Like, ah, this isn't working. But it, like it's incredible how it's really it it's working like it's not perfect and i'm sure we're going to get even better as we go and I, you know it's sometimes we have to take a moment to reflect on i can flush a toilet whenever i want right like that's incredible yep. and everything goes away <laughs> and you don't have to worry about this gross stuff that some people have to live with yep right so that's progress and and, and to segue a little bit in in the direction of this uh uh of this show i think one of the many roles that art can play is to uh, help us remember those things, especially, uh, you know, historical pieces can help to dramatize uh, in some way what life, you know, used to be like and, yeah. and some of the hardships of that. Yeah. And I definitely think some do that to some degree if they're not glorifying it, you know, th that era. Cause one of the problems you find with historical movies um, is that they tend to focus on the nobility Yes. And people forget that you're not like you and I, maybe you're noble blood, but I'm not noble blood. I mean, you could tell by looking at me. I ain't noble. Like I would have been a peasant, you know, dredging it up, you know, fighting and dying in the mud or something like that for some war. I don't know what that was going on. Right? Like that's that's where I come from. And that's where if you're listening to this, 99 percent of the ch of chances, if you were to be back then, that's you. You're not going to be, you know, living with high courts and, you know, courtly love and troubadours going around. Like maybe you'll see the troubadour as he walks by singing a song on his way to the castle. But really, your life sucks. And that, I think, is is um, difficult to, to put. The, the closest book novel I've ever read that makes me think of that is um, uh, Ken Follett. The oh, I always forget because I I mix it up with a fantasy book I read as a kid, Pillars Pillars of, of the Earth, the Earth, yeah. yeah, and that that because it focuses on the building of a church over the course of basically eighty years, and it does have a lot of the drudgery work of individual you know um, draftsmen or not just like stone masons and the yep. difficult things yep. that they had to go through. Yeah. So that that does dramatize that part. Yeah, it also so, dramatizes the the political difficulty. Yeah, yeah, the political difficulties too. Um so I mean there are books like that. You know, I so here's here's where I wonder if that is the actual necessity in the arts. For cuz part of your, your what you're saying I think is that the arts one thing the arts can do to to bolster your mission of getting people to appreciate it is to have them understand, you know, the difficulties that we used to have, right? Yeah, yeah. again, one, and not even necessarily the primary uh, functional okay. role of art, but it's it, it's just one thing, you yeah. know, one way that, you know, art, art, especially literature, uh, expands our minds in many ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I would agree that that's one thing, but I, I want to get to something more fundamental about, so about what I think art can offer and has offered in the past. So let, let's take one step away from what we were just talking about and discuss um, something you mentioned about in another show, and, and I think a couple of times I've heard you mention this, is progress is a concept that's not natural, and that which I agree with. It's not We're not born with progress you know, I think you put it 50,000 years, at least we've had higher functioning brains and it's only recently that we've seen progress. And I think this is part of the motivation of your whole project is like, why only the last couple hundred years after 50,000 years, I and mean, try and wrap your head around that length of time. Why only recently in one fraction of that whole time are we getting the kind of progress we have today? And I think that's the greatest question. That's the important question to ask. Um, and then I think you say, and correct me if I'm wrong with 
you know, paraphrasing your verbiage, but um, that other societies did not have that concept of progress. And so much or, or at, all, at all, I don't know, I don't know which one you would agree. Like, do you think the concept of progress, the way we ha that led to the 500 years is brand new or do you think that it was in the ancient Greeks and lost? That's my, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not an expert on ancient history. Um, my, if, if you look at what the Greeks did, uh, they certainly made a good amount of um, intellectual progress. And so you must say, at least implicitly, they, and I would say explicitly, they believed in uh, the ability to understand nature. They believed in the ability to at least make scientific, intellectual progress, better understanding, uh, better comprehension. Now, to my knowledge, they did not apply that so much to um, technology and industry. They did not yet have what I think would come later with Francis Bacon, the notion that knowledge would be useful that by understanding the world, we could apply it to, uh, to production, to, um, you know, to sort of making our lives better in a practical way. Okay, so I'm not 100% sure I agree with that one. Let's, let's, let's flesh that out a little bit. Now, I'm not an expert, but one, so one way to look at the ancient world is the, Gre we call it the Greco-Roman era. So one thing we can think about is like, you know, who invented concrete, which is one of your, you know, discussions. Um, and a very interesting article you have on concrete, and it's invented during this era, right? If I'm yeah, I mean, some some concrete technology is ancient, like way prehistoric. Uh, the okay. Romans did have uh, special advanced formulas of concrete, and they were masters of its use. That's that's for sure. And the Romans certainly did have, uh, you know, economic and kind of technological uh, innovations. They were, uh, they had better sanitation, I think, than Europe saw for probably about a thousand years afterwards. Yeah, you know, nice. they built the aqueducts. Yeah. Um, they certainly had, they had architecture, right? They had some understanding of some principles of what does it take to build a structure? And uh, some of their structures are still standing today. You can go see the Pantheon and that's, uh, you know, this enormous concrete dome. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, so I guess the, the question is obviously they didn't have the progress that we had, but they're also thousands of years ago, you know, just starting out. So, like, if we think about progress as helping humanity move forward in, in all aspects of life, flourishing, right, psychologically, emotionally, but also physically, uh, amount of people, right, that can survive and, and flourish, um, they did a good job of that given where they were coming from and where they were going. And then it stopped, and we could talk about the Dark Ages and, and you know, progress is not automatic or guaranteed forever. And in that case, they went backwards. And you know, like, can we go backwards? Like, that's another yeah, question, right? Exactly. And I, uh, the fact that uh, in this, in essence, there was a regression that progress was lost. Uh, I think both in terms of knowledge and technology and, and wealth, I think is again part of the motivation for let's really understand progress. Yeah. Let's see where it comes from because it's not uh, we we can't take it for granted. Yeah, and no, I, I totally agree. And that's what I'm trying to get to, and I'm, I'm beating around the bush because I want to, I guess, bring it up later, but I'll just say that the my th hypothesis on this whole thing, and it's been this way for years, actually, is my view is that the art comes first. So you have progress and the ideas of progress in the arts, which filter down or, or inspire people. Now, you could say that maybe intellectuals come up with some new theory and then the artists come or something like that. But I think like, what, cause what you see is in the ancient Greeks, for instance, like, and how they're separating from, for instance, the Egyptians and from other Mesopotamian cultures around them is that for the first time, you're really getting this idea of two, two fundamental ideas and that comes out in the arts and the ideas, the idea that man is great and that the world is wonderful in a place that you could do something with. So it's most perfect summation is in Sophocles, and is a famous quote, I don't know if you've heard this one, um, numberless are the wonders of the world, but none more wonderful than man, which has 
two premises, right? Numberless are the wonders. So it's a very positive view of the world. It says there's wonderful things. So if there's a wonderful thing out in the world, that means go look at it, right? There, you get your Aristotles, you get your even Plato's who want to investigate and ask questions, and Socrates who wants to ask moral questions. And th you have um, like a concept, I, I don't know if you've heard this concept, of Matisse. Have you heard of this in ancient Greek? So um, a, a literary character uh, <laughs> in uh, Homer's The Odyssey, Odysseus, I, I was thinking Oedipus for a second and I drew a blank. So Odysseus from The Odyssey represents Matisse. That's how he's defined, how he's understood. M-E-T-E-S? Well, yeah, it's, I've seen it spelled differently in English. Okay. Um, and, and the pronunciation, we don't really know sure. exactly how they, so I've heard it, Metis, um, Metas, or, I've heard like various, I don't know how it's pronounced. Um, Matisse is how I've heard it before. And it's M-E-T-I-S is how I've seen it. Mm. And, okay. but the, the concept is, it's like a wisdom with a, a practical cunning. So it's, it's wisdom and practical cunning. And so Homer, for instance, uses it in the Iliad to refer to when Nestor, the father, the, the old man at the, in this war, he tells his son, and I don't remember his son's name right now, how to drive a chariot. And he gives him this description of make sure you do the pole. Use, and it's, it's all about technique and improving and making sure you're, you know, you cover the leader and you, you keep your eye on the lead. You, you turn at a certain point. He gives them a very practical description and that's Metis or Matisse. And, um, you know, Homer uses it in other places for ship building is to, to build and to improve. So they improved in the Greek, Gre Greeks improved the trireme, right? And they created this great ship and they had this whole process of how to, to, you know, build it and develop it and create it and things like that. And so my point is that I think the Greeks had this concept and where it comes from is when it's expressed in the arts and now whether it's first expressed in the arts, I don't know. Um, but I think that it may very well be that that's a big part of it is how the arts are expressed. So for instance, you get man naked, strong, powerful in the sculptures um you get man conquering chaos in the on the parthenon if you look at the you know the the um i was afraid they're called like the little panels the freeze freeze thank you you know it's like it's man conquering the centaurs and all the all of chaos but the the point is that there's a it's capable and so that's what gives rise to shipbuilding to new statesman ideas and then the romans i think pick up on a lot of that fundamental viewpoint even though they have a much more just practical get it done don't worry about the moral you know viewpoints metaphysics and all that you know stuff does, that, does this make sense so i think that's a fundamental part is i would argue the arts are fundamental like and you know, so uh and so i'm curious how do you see that um if we look at how uh europe in particular let's say rose out of the dark ages after the fall of Rome and then, um, you know, into sort of the modern period, they went through the Renaissance, the Reformation and the Enlightenment. Yeah. Um, uh, and there was a whole there was a, a, a long, slow upwards progression uh, that then accelerated and got faster, in particular around Industrial Revolution time frame. And I'm curious, um, how do you see the art of that era as fitting in uh, to that story? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um... Petrarch is a good example. The poetry of Petrarch. Um, he is, I'm forgetting his dates. I think he's just at the beginning, I think, of what we would consider the Renaissance. And it's like early 1300s, probably uh, around late there, 1300s, late 1200s. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I, I can't remember his exact dates, but he is a very good artist or, or uh, poet for drawing pictures of the world. And he, he's talking about birds and he's relaying birds to love. And in a way, so he's, he's getting away from religious talk. And I think this is an important thing you start to see in the arts is that you're now, although there's still a lot of religious paintings, but there was a lot of stigma about creating religious arts and, and you know, what you're allowed to do. 
that starts, I think, g- stopping for some reason. I don't know why that happens, but you're able to draw like baby Jesus, for instance. And then, you know, what you start to see is you start to see a progressive improvement on how they're able to accurately and, you know, depict emotions, stories, you know, in an, a single painting image. And this yeah, is I've, I've seen that. You can see in the progression of the art that, their subject continues to be a very religious subject, but their technique is improving. Yeah. It's very um, earthly. It's more down to earth. It's not yeah. up in the heavens. And as I understand it, a theme of the Renaissance was um, people's. Uh, it was that in in the in the very religious era that preceded it, people were had such a focus on the other world that they didn't focus at all on this life, this world, on yeah, and humanity as a subject for study. It was just very eyes turned to God. And so the Renaissance wasn't as if they forgot about God, but they did start to pay more attention to life and earth and this world and yeah, and, well, and human your beings. like your emotions were started. And so, how do you convey emotion in art? Like you, oh, that's interesting. Now, were there changes in well, in how art uh, emotion was conveyed in art around that time? Well, I just mean like, well, yes, because if you look at like um like the these early paintings you're talking about, we're talking. Like if you ever see these, I should have got one for us to look at, but it's, you know, if you look at like 1200s or something, it's just a flat figure. It's pale. They have like a little gold. That's where we get the halos, like this gold thing. Yeah, over that's there. right. They're just kind of sitting there standing straight. Right. And it's like, oh, that's Jesus. And that's, you know, uh, Mary or something like that. Or that's Mary and Joseph. And that's it. Right. And that's the, that's the whole thing. They're not really expressing anything, but then, as time progresses now i i would argue that renaissance we call it renaissance because it means rebirth and it's a rebirth of greco greek ideas and it's an influx of these ideas from the greeks that and i think the idea is again you know we're it's because it's we, we always think of or a lot of us i think think of like aristotle and that's what it is and that's part of it because aristotle is a good embodiment of the greek way where he's called the peripatetic philosopher because he walked around, right? He wasn't just in his hot, you know, pie in the sky, like looking at the sky only and not looking at the world. He's like putting his hands in stuff and, and opening it up and looking at biology. And, you know, he didn't call it that, but looking, he's, he's looking at things, right? Or maybe he did call it biology. I should, I should take that back, you know, biologos, right? And so, but it, it's that spirit of numberless of the wonders of the world the world is full of wonders. And so if I'm an artist, I don't want to just like draw a circle and then an oval and like a little triangle for a nose. And that's it. Like I want to see the world and really express it and understand it. And you look at the leaves, how do the leaves fall? You know, what, what colors do they change? You know, I'm, I'm excited about the universe that I live in. And then there's the idea of falling in love with the, man right so that that what i'm i guess what to answer your question in a roundabout way is that i think there is this emotional shift that's occurring that they're capable of doing it but it comes from this spirit this metaphysical viewpoint this fundamental viewpoint of the numberless of the wonders of the world and you know more greater than man i think that's part like you have to have that expressed in the arts if you're going to have it in you know, so if you want it to continue for what you're talking about, you need, I think, that viewpoint. Yeah. So, so yeah, because I so I was I can move it somewhere else. Would you have? No, it's a, it's an interesting take, and I I think it would be very interesting to trace. I mean, there were many developments from that, you know, maybe the time of Petrarch to uh, the time of say Bouguereau, right? Um, and going through like many folks in between, it would be really interesting to trace that development and to also correlated to the developments in in uh science and industry that were happening and uh and even to see what we could find about direct uh, linkages um, yeah. so you know did for instance some of the some of the earliest um hmm. uh you know some of the earliest uh, uh projects the uh, the uh, big instances of progress i'm searching for a word for this were the voyages of discovery in the 14 late you know in the 1400s, um, especially the late 1400s, you know, Columbus and Da Gama and, uh, and then into the 1500s, you know, Europe was really starting to explore the world. This was part of the growth of our knowledge 
This was part of the active exploration of the world to learn and understand it better. Yeah. It was also a uh, part of rediscovering the idea of progress. Um, because in this time, there mm. was a, there was a, in this time, a great reverence for the ancients. Um, so a, a book that I quote a lot is uh, A Culture of Growth by the economic historian Joel Makir. He points out that uh, the, the opposite of the idea of progress is the idea of ancestor worship, that our ancient ancestors actually were the greatest people who ever lived, that they knew everything there was to know, that all knowledge was in fact revealed to them in ancient times, and that uh, all we can really do is kind of study their works and, and learn what they had to teach us. But, but we, on this view, we the moderns will never surpass them. We will never even equal them. Yeah. We can, you know, and uh, and the people in, you know, in, so in Europe in uh, you know, 13th, 14th century around then, what did they have to look at? Well, they looked back at huge things like the pyramids yeah. and they looked at these artifacts left from ancient Rome, like the Colosseum and the aqueducts. Like, Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, and and they looked up at this that? and they were like, yeah, those ancients, they were pretty awesome people. Look at this huge these huge things they left us. Yeah. How could they, you know, they could do all this. We don't do anything like this. So they thought they had, you know, plus these, these ancient texts that were left. So both on the, on the knowledge side and on the kind of practical, like construction and, and making stuff happen in the world, yeah. it really seemed like the, the ancients were this race of giants whom we could never, you know, we, we, the, the descendants of were, were a pale shadow of, and we had to slowly kind of crack that view. And yeah. so one of the first cracks were the voyages of discovery. When we found a whole continent or two that the ancients never knew about and never wrote anything about. Well, that was an indication that maybe not all of the knowledge was revealed to them, you know. Yeah. And as we went on in the 1500s and 1600s um, and discovered more and more things as, as science progressed, um, we, we started to realize, well, maybe we can... maybe we can make some progress. Maybe this progress thing is actually possible. By the time of Newton, Newton's Principia was the, you know, in some way kind of final nail in the in the coffin of this argument, mm. because uh, it was very clear to people by that point that we had a new system of the world, that someone, one of us moderns, had created something that far surpassed anything the ancients knew. Um, and it would be interesting to sort of track all those developments alongside some of the developments in art going on at the same time. And what inspired some of those creators? Were they inspired by the poetry, by the, you know, whatever was coming out of art and philosophy? So I have one, and let me. Do you know um, Balboa? I don't remember his first name. One of the first people to step on the Pacific. Uh, yes, I believe, right? Yes, an explorer. Yeah, one of the Spanish, I believe. Yeah. Um, so I was. I'm not an expert on this. I, I wrote something a while back um, on a poem by Poe called El Dorado, and I looked into this. Have you read that poem, El Dorado? No. Um, Gaily bedight a gallant knight in sunshine and shadow, had journeyed long, singing a song in search of El Dorado. And I, I think I could do the rest of it, but I, I don't want to try. <laughs> but that's the first stanza. But the, I looked into the story of El Dorado as, an, as a mythical story. And myth is art, I think, is one thing. Balboa and many of those and I don't know about Columbus, but I, I know many explorers at this time were motivated to find the city of gold. Balboa was actually trying to find the city of gold. And so I think there's something, you know, the, that, that kind of artistic, you know, the, the, like there's this mythical thing. That's what pushes them. They don't even come close to it because it doesn't exist in this case. But that's actually what is, that's the fuel for them is like, I'm going to get up, I'm going to get to find this mythological place. Frankenstein has, a, the, the novel has a, an explorer, Captain Robert Walton, I believe his name is. I'm so bad with names, I apologize if I'm butchering this. And, that sounds right. And he is, um, he's trying to find the northern, the, the northern part of the world. The, the, you know, I think it's the North Pole or whatever. But it, it's the... Um, I cannot remember the name of the land, but it's an actual mythical. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. So he's actually looking for something that people really believed, which is this mythological space that if you went there, it'd be like this, this immortal land of the, you know, gods or whatever, uh, kind of like an Eden. That's basically all the way at this top, this northernmost part of the, the whole uh, earth. 
and um, he's actually motivated to find that last discovery that people haven't been able to get to. And I think there is something where these trailblazers are motivated by something that we can call. And when I say motivate, I mean like that's the fuel that gets them up in the morning. It's like, I'm going to find the city of gold. All right. Here's, you know, they, they get their whiteboards, <laughs> their 1500s, 1300s whiteboards, right? And like, all right, so here's the city of gold. Now we just got to go through it, right? And they're like telling, inspiring their men. And that's what wakes them up. And we got to figure out how to make this boat because that's what's going to. But the, the fuel under that is art. Yeah. And the relationship is reciprocal. So artists yeah. themselves are inspired by uh, explorers and discovery. And I mean, scientists. when you mentioned looking upon the Pacific, I was just thinking of that poem by Keats. Yeah. Where he's on first looking on Homer. Exactly. Um, right. And he Chapman's Homer. And he he makes an analogy or a metaphor, a connection between his experience of reading Chapman's translation of Homer and what it must have felt to, I think in the poem he actually mistakenly says Cortez, Cortez, but you know, what it must have felt for those first explorers who first gazed upon the Pacific, and that's how he felt. Um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge uh, was said to have attended physics lectures by Humphrey Davy uh, in order to increase his stock of literary metaphors. Yeah. So. No, I, that, that is very helpful. Like I'm doing, so I'm writing a sci-fi novel and, um, and I'm doing it cause I love classic sci-fi, not modern sci-fi, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm, I'm reading a lot of sci-fi and I was trying to come up with, um, so I, I didn't want it to be fantasy. So I have a view that if, that if it doesn't have any science in it, it's not science fiction, it's fantasy. So like Star Wars is fantasy, not science fiction. Right, because uh, it doesn't have any science in it, and um, even if the science is kind of outrageous, like Minority Report, Philip K. Dick, that is science. Like even though they're predicting the future, but they're using science in its you know hypothetical way at least, um, or is at least somewhat plausible. I think, or at least they're using it to make it feel plausible. I think that's important for science fiction. Anyway, and I was doing research, and I was like, well, I don't know anything about science. So this is hard for me. Um, so, I, so I, you know, I was looking, I was trying to create an, a mineral on Mars. Like what could you create a new mineral? Like, could there be, could we discover a new mineral? And I had to start learning about chemistry, which I'd never learned anything about chemistry. Like I'm such an idiot, never learned anything about chemistry. And so I thought, well, maybe you could like, maybe you could, cause I didn't understand for instance, and this was like rev- very revealing of how dumb I am. Like just this couple of weeks ago, like I didn't understand what chemistry really did. I don't understand what it did. like measuring atoms essentially is what it is. And so you can't get smaller than that. So there's not, there's only so many elements that there can be. And, um, you know, now it's, it's very difficult to come up with a new element. Right. So my, my whole point was like, I wanted there to be like Martian oil that was like a hundred times better than the oil that we have. But it's like that may not be. Well, that would be a new molecule rather than a new element. Or the, yeah, maybe that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. So the reason I came here today was to learn how to write my book, so you could help me <laughs> with like figure out this problem. Um, but yeah. So, but I mean, that's that's art trying to learn from science and I th- or from you know the real world. And I think good artists look out into the real world and including what's happening in science and in technology. And you know, you see this with like Robert Heinlein. He wrote. Um, lots of great books about like how spacesuit will travel, right? Where it's like they're just he's writing in like the fifties, sixties before the space program, but the, there's people doing stuff like this. There's people in jets that they've hit the, the the outermost parts of our atmosphere already in jets, and you know it's only a matter of time. And so he has this fantasy idea of, well, what if we had the spacesuit that could just put you all over the universe, right? That'd be cool, right? And so he writes this really cool story, which is one of the first sci-fi stories I wrote, read as a kid. Um, so, I, yeah, I think they go back and forth. I, I think if you look at guys like Musk, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, um, Elon Musk talks about sci-fi. He, he's a, he was a big reader when he was a kid. And I don't think that's a coincidence that he wants to go to Mars, right? Jeff Bezos... Um, I don't know as much about his reading, but I know he's a big reader. Uh, Bill Gates is obviously a huge reader. Yeah, I think lots of people who are in technology today. So certainly in the 20th century, science fiction, I think, has had a significant role in motivating people. Um, You know, so many people, it's it's surprising to me to, to realize how many people in technology today, and especially in space technology, but but all kinds of things, were motivated specifically by Star Trek. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a great story. Uh, so uh, on the the Q and A website Quora, there was a user whose name coincidentally was Robert Frost. Okay. <laughs> He's a NASA uh, scientist engineer. And uh, he wrote a lot of great stuff on Quora about space. But in particular, someone asked him uh, or someone asked about how he got motivated. And he told the story about um, seeing Star Trek as a kid and as a very young child, uh, deciding pretty early on that he was going to join Starfleet when he grew up and having to be told that it didn't exist yet. And it was about the distant future, you know, hundreds of years in the future. And he decided, nope, can't wait that long. I'm yeah. going to go make it happen. Yeah. I'm going to go join whatever we got and I'm going to I'm going to, you know, bring this future into the present as as fast as possible. And yeah. uh uh and, and it was a very deep and emotional uh, you know, reaction for him. And so um I mean so to to back up a little bit, I think your you know, your general point about art inspiring people and pointing the way is absolutely true. One thing that I've seen again and again from my study of these stories of progress is uh, in in science, in technology, in business, progress is difficult. It's hard. It's lonely. Yeah. Uh, you set out to do something, and nobody knows if it can be done. Even you don't know if it can be done. You think so, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, you know the whole world maybe is telling you that it's impossible, and and some of the world is telling you that even if it were possible, you shouldn't do it. That you know that it's going to be a disaster. Maybe really smart people, maybe accomplished, you know, older scientists and engineers are telling you that you're completely on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. So there's all of this. You've got to have something's got to really be emotionally motivating you, driving you, pushing you forward, giving you that that confidence and courage, giving you something to hang on to, some kind of emotional fuel. It's very clear to me that, um, you know, that you've got to have something like that, whether it comes from art, from philosophy, from from whatever these creators and innovators have to have some way of, of holding on and pushing through, through all of their you know trials and tribulations. Yeah. And so there's, um, so I mean, I think that's one of the issue, one of the ways that art and sciences match up. Science fiction is a clear example. And um, especially if it's real science fiction, right? I think, um, I mean, I, so there is something, I guess, to be said about these, you know, like Star Trek, which is, you know, it's using photons and stuff, which may not be possible in theoretical science. Like I got, I know I've heard, I've seen some shows that are like some YouTube channels that show like, oh, these are kind of possible. So it's, you know, that I would have to define that as science fiction under my premise. And they do kind of feed into each other is the point. So like you said, someone's inspired to be in the Sarge fleet. It doesn't exist. They want to go do it. Someone, you know, hears about the city of gold. He wants to see if it's real. So he goes and finds it and discovers the new world or, you know, new areas of the new world that were never discovered before. And, you know, what was dark is now light and, you know, in terms of our knowledge of it. Right. And that's pushed by this imagination. I mean, really on a common sense level, if we're talking about this level of art, I think art does other things is my point. But if we're talking about this level of art, I think it's, it's somewhat common sense. It's almost like the, uh, you know, measure twice, cut once principle. It's it's like, you know, you, you think it, then you do it. Right. So the, if we think about that part of humanity, it's clearly we have to think it's possible. And then, you know, like you said, cause those guys that couldn't well, So for instance, the, I, I, something I know more about a little bit because I read David McCullough's book. I know you like David of uh, the Wright Brothers. Mm-hmm. Did you read that one? Uh, I haven't read that one yet. It's I've very, read a couple it's, of it's, other. It's a short one. Yeah. Um, but it's it's an excellent book, and it's exactly what you're saying in terms of no, they didn't know they they could do it, right? Because of course people have floated on the air, but the problem was heavier than air machinery that could fly. That's the problem that they were trying to solve, and you know. But they did have hundreds and thousands of years of fantastical stories. Now, interesting thing here, side note, where all these stories actually inspired them to some degree to try to fly, but led them in the wrong way metaphorically. Because, um, I don't know if you, well, you haven't read the book. For me, the most fascinating thing for this was that the way they were, de- art depicted flight was often like a boat. Like birds. Like a boat? Yeah, it was often, it was often oh. like ships that float. Huh. So what 
the Wright brothers did was they started becoming fascinated with birds. Like how did birds do it, right? How do they do it in real life? And they use this analogy of, uh, cause a lot of the people who were trying to invent flight were using some kind of ship, like the ship analogy in, in the air. That was what they were trying to create. And the Wright brothers changed and shifted everyone's thinking by saying, no, we need to make it look more like, um, you know, a bird. Cause again, it's, it's not That's about, fascinating. it's not about like flapping your wings. Like, yeah, people had tried that. Again, it's about having metal in the air. That's the, so people thought, well, we have to have the ship and they thought maybe high enough up, there were these currents that you could float on or something like mm-hmm. that. And, um, I think there was this famous, I'm trying to remember from David McCullough's book. It's been a while, but there was like this famous speech they gave where they had like a tank of water and they like, put something on it and they said well there's not water in the air and and he like dropped a piece of paper so they could see how it floated and he said this is how we're going to make it happen or something like that and then they you know of course did it so that's that's a case where art helped but also got in the way in that particular case (laughs) yeah well it's motivating it's motivation it's not a blueprint it's definitely not a blueprint (laughs) so yeah it's it's um you know starfleet may not look at all like right the star track it's yeah although i have seen some inspiration models i don't know if you've seen like online people are like here's nasa's model in 20 years and it's like i don't know if you're like copying the enterprise a little too much man <laughs> like you can get outside of that a little bit and think <laughs> think differently that second part i think the think differently part is another thing i think art is very helpful in helping you do is how to think differently so I'm trying to remember what you were saying earlier. We get in like as a, or as creators, or you have to be able to get outside of the way things have always been, right? So let, let me ask you this. Maybe we can go from here. So you have this idea of in teaching progress, there's problem and solution, and that's how is that correct? Am I remembering that? Well, that's that's certainly how I like to write about progress to help bring the stories out. I try okay, to look at, right. show both what was the problem that people were facing that, that motivated any kind of solution, and then how was the problem actually solved? Yeah, so there's... It gives a certain narrative orientation to telling the story. Yeah. Okay, so I lost where I was going to go with that, because I wanted to do something with... We said something earlier about um, how people changed, like got outside of their mindset to create something new, but that's okay. So let, let's change gears to the a question that I've been holding off on. And I'm be curious about is in, in a lot, in your research on technology. So I don't know this at all, but in your research on technology in like steel, for instance, and in your, your um, you have a cool YouTube video on the history of steel. And you go back all the way to bronze and before that, really. And I'm curious if, you know, because one of the things you could do with bronze is sculptures. And that was one of the things they did do in ancient Greek and, you know, other societies. Do you think that the creation of arts might have helped in the development of what was possible with that metal? Like uh, just from a cra- like a technological standpoint, so like I want to create something new with this metal, and I don't have a piece of technology that like for like I don't have a uh, like a, a, a thing other than weapons that I want to build with it. I want to build this sculpture, but I need a new kind of kiln or I don't know whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. I so I'm not. Um... I don't know anything about the relationship of maybe sculptures to. Um, to the metal, so so iron and steel are the the the, the metal metals uh, that I have looked into the most. I haven't actually looked into the history of bronze. Um, I don't know of any connections to art. Now, for something like a sculpture, um, you really want to. I was you really want to cast it. So there are different ways of of forming metal, right? Um, an ancient blacksmith, for instance, would forge it with you know hammer and tongs on an anvil right you take a piece of metal that's not liquid you get it hot you get it just a you know malleable and then you can pound it into shape now i that's not really appropriate for an artist you need more fidelity 
Um, so the way that, uh, and I don't know how many of your, of your viewers know this, but I mean, the way that bronze sculptures are made is through casting into a mold, right? So you begin with clay, you sculpt in clay, and then there's a process by which a, uh, a, a mold is formed from the clay, uh, the clay model, and then you can pour molten bronze into the mold and cast it into the, the proper shape. Um, now if you were to do that with iron, uh, you could do that with cast iron. Uh, cast iron is a fairly old technology, goes back to um, certainly, I think, 13, 1400s in Europe and much older than that in China. Um, I can't remember if it's five. I think it's, I think it's actually like 500 BC or something in China that they had hmm. uh, cast iron. So, um, yeah, that took anybody anything. Who, China <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> didn't tell anybody. They, they don't tell anybody. Well, there wasn't that much. <laughs> there wasn't that like, much contact uh, oh, between yes. between East and West yeah, um, at the time. Uh, but uh, you know, now I I believe there were sculptures uh, made out of cast iron. I don't know much um, about that. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, they made they made art out of everything. Yeah. So that's something, especially the Greeks, where you know their pottery had art all over it. Yeah. Right. They're very famous for their pot their their um, pottery making. I don't know if all cultures do that. I think most cultures do some kind of art all over stuff. Sure. Especially if you look back at like um, uh, kind of like Renaissance Reformation era, you know, into Victorian era artifacts. They're yeah. so much more ornate. Um, yeah. I was just in a few weeks ago, I was visiting Oxford and I was in a history of science museum there. And we were looking at these different instruments and uh, one of them was a microscope made for the king. I think it might have been King George. Uh, might have been King George the Third at the time. I'm trying to remember which king it was, but it was made for the King of England. I'm pretty sure. And it was it was silver, and it had these sculptures on it. I mean, it was a it was an art object in itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, those old those old artifacts were much more um, ornate and decorated. And today. Uh, yeah, so many of our artifacts are much more utilitarian. Yeah, I mean they def and they definitely don't have they might have some cool like fig not even, they don't even have figures, like patterns. I guess is how most art today or most like utensils if they have anything or, or dishware, it's like maybe it's one color or it maybe has some patterns and that's it. Yeah. But I it, it'd be hard to equate that to any kind of art another thing they had a lot of in that museum was astrolabes so astrolabes? you look up yeah look up astrolabes especially i believe persian astrolabes were just astrolabes. these ornate so an astrolabe is an instrument um it looks like a disc of metal it's really a few a few discs of metal um with lines etched on them and uh they can rotate with respect to one another and it is a um it's basically a calculating instrument for astronomers. Uh, so the the astrolabe, if you, I believe the way it works is you adjust it for your latitude, uh, where you are on the Earth, and then also for the day of the year, and uh, it shows you essentially where in the sky you will find at that time of year uh, different known stars and constellations. I'm gonna pop this on screen. And it, yeah, that'd be great if you have um. A good, yeah, sure. That's, that's a great. <laughs> that's a great. Uh, <laughs> I'll just bring, but you can go to. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, but, um, yeah, and so some of these are some of these are gorgeous, and they're uh, and they're ordinary. I mean, they're just so just walking around looking at all these old scientific instruments. Not to mention the microscopes. Uh, they had uh, uh and uh, you know just other kinds of uh things, and they were you know they're made out of these metals and ivory cool. and they had these etchings on them and it was uh just yeah very ornate and artistic that's awesome yeah i mean so I, I don't know why it feels like we've sort of lost that today well i think i have an idea i think we've lost so this maybe could be one of the final things we talk about um in terms of the progress in the arts and the sciences i, I think we've lost a little bit at least maybe more than a little bit of the admiration and respect for craftsmanship. Mm. So when I talk about progress in the arts, one thing is craftsmanship. And, you know, so um, the meticulous time and training that sculptors, painters, writers went through in the past is nothing like what we'd go through today. It's not what I've gone through to be a writer. I, I try, but I, 
not at all in my fiction in terms of what someone, you know, even 100, 150 years ago would have gone through in terms of studying and mastering Latin and Greek and, you know, other languages and then our own language in speaking and writing and, you know, being able to translate. I mean, there's this, um, just to give you an example, like the uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge who wrote lyrical ballads. I just did a whole big thing on reading all the poems from lyrical ballads by those two on the podcast. And they did, you know, they were pretty poor. Um, Coleridge had a little bit of more money, but they went to Germany to try to learn the German language, which was a different kind of language than what they've studied before. And um, the point was that they wanted to, you know, like you said, with Coleridge trying to learn from Humphrey, is that the individual Coleridge? Yeah, Humphrey Davy, the Humphrey Davy. science lecturer, yeah. So you want to learn from him for, for metaphors, the same kind of idea. They want to learn, you know, to get better ideas, to, to understand so they could put it in their art and master language in general. Look at how... We, I don't think we have that as much today with that kind of meticulous nature. If you, you know, sculptures is a really good example. So when I talk about progress, I, I think, again, if you look at, you know, 8th century sculptures of like a horse in, in um, ancient Greece and then go a couple hundred years later and see what they've been able to depict, that's progress, right? Like it's the 8th century is like, their nose is like spiral. It's just like a cylinder legs and like a little, you know, s cylinder for the body. And that's it. Right. So in sculpture, it, it feels to me like sculpture peaked around the Renaissance. I mean, yeah, that, well, I mean, have we, you know, Michelangelo's David, technique. has there been anything, you know, has there been anything to, to even, you know, really rival something like, Michelangelo's David, right? That was what fourteen hundreds, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and here we are, several hundred years later. It's the one. So, so art doesn't quite, to my mind, match this pattern of, uh, you know, of of science and uh, and technology and industry and so forth, where, um, For you know, those part. those things just took a sharp hockey stick upward in yeah. you know around seventeen hundred ish. I haven't thought about that. That's a really good point, Ash. I haven't think about that more. And, and it I, feels I to me right. like some of the arts maybe peaked in the past and then... Um... Well, from a craftsman standpoint, maybe. Yeah. There may be the techniques have basically been developed. Now, right? now of, at least from a craft, uh, craft standpoint, cinema certainly has been getting... Uh, I think I think craft has been um, increasing in many ways. Um, so certainly since the art form was first yeah, developed right i mean this is where it gets i think a little complicated so so i i don't know that we have peaked with sculpture i think you're right but i don't know so for instance you know are there new materials we could be using so we've probably peaked with what we could do with marble and by the way when i say peaks i don't mean necessarily i'm not projecting into the future saying we'll never yeah, you know, no, at no point in the future will we ever be. Uh, I'm just, I'm just looking at the at the history, at uh, the past up until today. Oh, I see. Yeah, I definitely. Know, I, I don't think we've done anything new in sculpture except for mangle it up. Same thing with all arts. Like all arts have basically went into this movement of abstract art, and which is basically just a hodgepodge of putting stuff together randomly without any order generally it's with you know it's whatever it feels to me uh kind of idea and there has been a lo definite loss of craft and now but the question is you know did they i, I thought you said they peaked in ancient in renaissance like can like that's the best we've gotten to i think yes that's probably the greatest was that era it was michelangelo like that's are you going to get any but but the question is can you do more than that or is that the ultimate, right? Uh, I think there's a similar. Well, I'm an optimist. Science. I always think we can do something better in the future, even yeah. if we don't know what it is. Yeah, and and but I think this the similar question in the sciences, right? Like maybe you know, like I, when I was looking at chemical chemistry, you know, and and coming up with new, um, thing, you know, uh, mo molecules or what what do we call? Disco it? Yeah, sure. Discovering new. Well, I mean, we went through a period of discovering elements, elements that's what and figuring thinking. out which substances even yeah. were elements, and, right? And a lot of it's combining elements. But at this point, 
like what I was saying is like they have to use these huge particle or very complex, expensive like particle accelerators, something like that to to ma- hopefully mash these two elements together to get. To that's see looking if yeah well, and that's looking at subatomic particles. So okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, what, so what we went through in the 17, I would say late 1700s and through the 1800s was identifying what are the elements, what different types of atoms are there, basically. By this point, we kind of think we've discovered most of the uh, well, reading, most yeah. of the types of atoms that are stable, at least. Yes. Real, the really big heavy atoms uh, tend to be radioactive and they break down very quickly. They're not they're not stable. There's a side note. There's a theory that there might be say, that there might be some stable ones reading. that are much heavier than anything we've ever seen or created. But yeah. setting that aside, what's that we, one called? Uh, there's this theory called the island of stability. Island of stability. If yeah. you look that up in chemistry, yeah. But setting that aside, that's why I'm gonna put my science fiction book in the island. Of sure. Stability. Yeah, that would be a really that would be an interesting one. That's what I was looking. Um, for. But but apart from that, we've discovered uh, apart from a theoretical or potential island of stability, we've discovered uh, you know all of the pretty much all the stable elements. I think. Yeah. But of course, those can be combined in almost an infinite number of ways uh, in in molecules. Um, what the what they but do with the particle kind of accelerators is uh, the particle accelerators is is actually going beneath the elements. It okay. turns out that it turns out atom, even though atom comes from the Greek atom, meaning indivisible, turns out atoms are not indivisible. Uh, it turns out they are composed of even smaller what are known as subatomic in a sort of would paradoxical term atoms, subatomic well but we we didn't want to, by the time we figured out what atoms were we didn't want to rename them yeah so, so that, it's so an I unfortunate mean, like it's an unfortunate <laughs> that seems like our problem not the greeks don't put that on the greeks man no i don't blame the greeks because <laughs> the greeks just said this is there's an individual molecule out there it's not my fault you didn't figure it out guys I'll give you 2500 years man but that's what at the Large Hadron Collider yeah. and other particle accelerators is what they're doing they're looking at subatomic yeah um particles but yeah but okay. now something like oil, you mentioned a potentially a new form of oil. Oil is a is a is a molecule. Some oils are relatively large molecules, right? They're known as hydrocarbons. They involve a carbon chain with uh, you know hydrogens and sometimes other atoms involved. So, yeah, but I, I was trying to think. So um, I was trying to wrap my head around the progress in craft of sculpture, right? Is is kind of the idea here, though? And so you think that there's you're optimistic there might be progress there. Oh, just and on general principles. Just on general principles. Because um, it is an interesting question. I don't know. Like, it's making my mind kind of blow up for a second because it's like, wait a second, maybe maybe that is the max. But then, it, like I was saying, I think we feel the same way about, that's why I was bringing up chemistry, about sciences or, or certain, you know, uh, technological improvements. Maybe this is pretty much peak technology. Right, maybe there's not that much more ahead of us. And I don't think that's true either. No, I think um, I mean I think I it's think easier to cl- see what are the advances still to be made in technology and yeah. science for that matter, right? There's a lot that's obvious to go learn and to go do. do. Let me ask you this. Do you think there are fundamental new things in technology, science that are procedure based? What do you mean? Or what's, so an, ex- like what's an example? So craftsmanship is a procedure, essentially, right? It's like how, like, it's the process, like, crafting a statue is the process by which you, or, like, if you're blowing glass, right, there's, and you're going to make artwork out of blowing glass, there's a process by which you go through where you use the, the heat, you tamper it, and there's a, you know, maybe that process has been pretty much perfected, and um, but there's a lot you could do with that that we haven't even thought of yet. Right. And, and same thing with like sculpting metal, sculpting marble, that the process is kind of figured out. But it, then now there's an infinite amount of things you can do with it. So in technology is the process by which we come up with new things figured out. And now it's just coming up with those new things. Does that make sense? That formulation on the face of it sounds too well, formulaic, too prescriptive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think it's never that simple. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So that I mean, that was just my kind of throwing something out there for craftsmanship, yeah. because like, what's like where I've seen progress is in you know these abilities to depict what we want artistically, mm-hmm. and now it's what 
The question is, what do we want to, to depict? And now that's where the choice really lies, right? In the past, where it's like, I want to depict this kind of emotion, this complex emotion of how a mother feels after losing her son, but she knew she was going to have this happen in the beginning, and she it was part of her duty to accept it, right? And so how am I going to depict that in stone, right? And that's the pieta, right? And so you get that question and then there's the tech and the, the David you brought up, there's the technical question of, you know, bringing this person alive and putting like flesh and stone where it looks like flesh. And how do you technically do that? I don't, I wonder, I'm sure there are some technical things in the arts that we can still figure out, but we need to be more willing to delve into deeper aspects of, human psychology and human life. And I think that's where we have not progressed in the arts in the last like hundred years or so. And I think that's part of the, the problem I've seen in the arts in, because again, if you take my stance that there is progress where we had something that was not good, like the horse example. And then we got to, it looks like a horse that looks like a horse, you know, in sculpture, but then that's okay. That's great. But what are you going to do with that for art? Like what's the point of that? And the point of it in art is to convey something to an, an audience, to a person who's listening to it, to a future, you know, science goer or, yeah. or technician. Yeah. And you certainly won't get any argument from me that there has, over the course of human history, there has been progress in art. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right. You can you can look especially at ancient things. You can look at the peak of what was the peak of technique, the best craft. And you can see how that got, you know, better over over certain periods of time. Um, bigger question, just as some people have been asking about um, stagnation in science and in economic progress, is, is you know, or is there some sort of stagnation in the art world in which which parts of art and how long has it been going on? And, and of course, the ultimate question, you know, why and can we well, do you think it's in the sciences? There's stagnation in the sciences and technology. There's some uh, argument and evidence that uh, not that progress has leveled off, but that, you know, and completely stopped. But that it's slowing down. That we're just not making progress as fast as we used to be. Yeah. In like say the nineteenth century or the early twentieth. Like I always think of going from the car essentially in the late eighteen hundreds to space. Yep. And it's like seventy years essentially. That seems crazy when you really like. There was someone alive who theoretically could have seen the first car, and seen someone go to the moon. Yep. Like that's crazy to think about when you like you could like. Yeah. Just wrap your head around that. Not not. My, I'm. I was born in '85, so in born in '85, I saw Game Boy to uh, virtual reality video games, which is kind of a pretty crazy, impressive what they've been able to do, and maybe that is where a lot of the improvements need to be for the future. Or maybe the next, you know, the per kid born in 2015, you know, he's gonna see VR when and when he, you know, as a kid. And, you know, Tesla's and, and these types of things. What's he going to see in at 2050? Right. Like that's that's kind of what you're all about is making sure that progress at least continues. Yeah. And now you're saying that there is a slowdown, an argument. There's at least possible. some evidence of, of one. Yeah. And would the examples I give be a slowdown or like evidence of that or? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, some of the comparisons you drew, right? So like that in the last several decades, we've seen a lot of progress in, you know, one area is computing technology and information technology. Uh, but in the previous, you know, say mid 1800s to mid 1900s, we actually saw, you know, sort of equivalent amount of progress, but maybe across multiple areas, right? The entire oil industry was developed in that time, the internal combustion engine, the automobile, uh, rockets and, um, the, uh, you know, pretty much all of electronic communications from the telegraph to the telephone, uh, the, the photography, you know, was invented, uh, film was invented, yeah. uh, radio and television. Um, and so you can just, you can just kind of go on and on. Uh, the Bessemer steel was 1850s and first transcontinental railroad in the U S was 1860s. Um, so, uh, you know, the interstate highway system, 1950s. So that, that whole, you know, period, um, we just saw so much progress in so many different areas. 
And uh, there has been a lot of progress since 1970 or kind of wherever you want to draw the line. But a lot of it has been restricted to a single area, which is information technology and computers. And yeah. um, Which just know. doesn't seem as impressive. I think it I is. I mean, it's impressive in its own right. The question is, why don't we have the same thing going on in like a few different areas not yeah. to mention what about the what about the areas of progress that we should have had or thought we were going to have that got somewhat cut off what about nuclear yeah. uh power what about um supersonic air travel which we had and then lost and you know just now today is maybe uh, where somebody's working on bringing it back that'd be cool um right? what about uh yeah i love that um you know uh, what are some other things i mean you, well you space travel at, yeah well sure I mean, what about the space program we, we went to the moon then we we stopped Going to the moon. I mean, the joke is like our my father. He doesn't say this, but my father's generation says they promised us flying cars. Where's our, where's my flying car? Yeah, that's right. right? There's I, <laughs> I think there was uh, Peter uh, Thiel or his uh, uh, his his investor fund. Yeah, he got, it popularized this. Uh, we we were promised flying cars, and we got 140 characters referring to Twitter. Yeah, I think there's <laughs> some truth. To that. I think he's obviously exaggerating for a fact. Yeah, because obviously to get you that 140 characters everywhere on the planet. In six billion pockets, yeah. that is it's, impressive. It's, it is pretty impressive, and for what it's worth, it looks like the thing we're going to get before we get flying cars is self-driving cars. Yeah, uh, and I'm hopeful that's that will come cool. in the next decade or so, yeah. and that is going to be huge. So, what would stop that progress? Hmm. Because you're saying progress. There's evidence progress is slowing down. I think there is. I have a view of what does it for technology yeah uh political view do you want to yeah sure do you want to share what's your view well so i'll just put it this way i think um <laughs> alan greenspan has an article in ayn rand's book of essays the capitalism the unknown ideal on the gold standard and finance and um he talks about we don't really appreciate uh slow down and what slowdown means economically, because it means that things that would have been developed weren't developed, which could have had a, a multiplicity of effects that we can't comprehend. So when we say we've, you know, lost, you know, going off the gold standard and, and losing the ability to be completely free. So when you think about like the 19th century, they're completely free, whatever the hell they want, basically. I mean, people get, for the most part, I mean, there's, there's some restrictions. If people get blown up, they get blown up, right? That's, that's life, right? If, uh, if you're trying to do, so there's, you have this freedom to do this kind of thing. And so people, I, I, I saw this movie, the, uh, the current war that just came out. Did you see that? Oh yeah. No, but I read a book about the same thing. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's pr pretty yeah. interesting. Edison movie. versus Westinghouse. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like the things that they were willing to do, the, the sacrifices they were willing to make, how hard. And it's not saying that they don't do that today, but it just seemed like, it seems like there's more restrictions that you have to deal with that aren't the thing, the, the thing you're trying to invent. Right. So like, I, okay, I got to, pay these politicians and deal with this bureaucracy yeah. that gets in the way of inventing the next big thing. Yeah, so it's and, like brain power. And loss. some, you know, and, and I mean, some things, uh, uh, I think some things like increases in say safety standards, I think are, you know, probably a good thing. Um, I also, but I think there is, is it safe. I think to invent new things. Oh, you know, there's no such thing as like perfect 100% safety. Um, but there are, you know, there are practices. No, but listen, have you read the book, The Right Stuff by Tom Wolf? Long time ago. I yeah. really rec I'm reading it now. I love it. It's very interesting. The amount of fighter pilots that died trying to learn jet propulsion yeah. and, um, you know, going to the sp going to space. I mean, it's not safe to do big things. And I think there's something where you have to appreciate life, but... You know, his whole book is about what bravery is. You know, why are they doing this? I mean, because like, he paints this picture of this young man, I don't remember his name right now, but um, who's a fighter pilot who goes through, uh, you know, in like a year, he's going to funeral after funeral. And he draws this picture of this guy who's, you know, he has no money and he has to put on his dress uniform with his wife, who's like freaking out a little bit now because of the life she's leading of like funeral after funeral after funeral, these brutal deaths. Right, like he describes them. Tom Wolf describes them in brutal detail. But I think that how could you do jet propulsion without that? Like, could you learn 
jet propulsion propulsion without that. Yeah, I, I don't know about that particular example. I think no doubt there are, uh, I mean, there are risks involved in exploration and that involves exploring new areas of knowledge, new areas of science. I mean, the pioneers of understanding x-rays, uh, you know, paid a price for it. Um, they they themselves were that. overexposed and, oh, and some of them that. died of radiation. It makes oh, yeah. sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, right. So there are um, there are absolutely, uh, you know, there. Yeah, there are risks and we take these risks in order to push the frontier. And ultimately, safety overall just gets better and better. I mean, we are yeah. all, all, on the whole, on average, we're you have much safer. choice to be more safe. You should sure. be. And that is an achievement. I mean, that's one of the things that yeah. we want to achieve with all of yeah. our technology and our industry and our, our wealth and infrastructure is to make the world safer. And we have made the world. And we should keep doing that. But what I'm saying is, like, if we're talking about progress, like yep. new innovations. Yep. No, there is an is inherent it, risk to being on the frontier. But so then do safety standards get in the way of that is what I'm saying. So if you have safety standards, it's like, okay, well, it's really hard for me to experiment when, you know, on in chemical properties in humans, if I want to do life extension or, or get rid of something, if I can't, you know, get volunteers who have cancer who are dying to try this thing that I don't know if it's going to work or not, yeah. you know, as long as they sign the paperwork, like, why not? It's their life. And that might be necessary for, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, uh, so I would like that to develop a, a nuanced opinion on this topic, which I do not have yet. However, okay. I do think that um, I don't have one either. Creeping <laughs> bureaucratization is, you know, is a hypothesis for you know if there is something of a stagnation now, what could be causing it? Well, yeah, more and more bureaucracy and uh, sort of process and restrictions and. Um, uh, and just more overhead to everything is is one hypothesis for it, and I think a, uh, I mean a, certainly a plausible one to me. Well, so, I mean, but do you? Okay, so that I guess that's my view, and I guess I, I agree it's it's a hypothesis. I, I, it would be interesting to do a thought experiment, and I think this has been done in fiction of a land without any restrictions except you can't just murder people. Right. So the only restriction is, um, you know, force, you can't force other people as Ayn Rand's viewpoint, you can't force other people to do something. And in that environment, you know, where people do everything voluntarily that you can have explosion of. Yeah. Sort of a, yeah. Laissez faire capitalist, uh, yeah, laissez -faire capitalist. Kind of a political science fiction. I mean, so I, I'm not a, yeah. Political science fiction for sure. Yeah. Um, or like the Bioshock, uh, game, if you've ever seen that, I haven't. I've heard of it. I haven't I've never played I've it. Never but played I've heard it. about it, and it's, it seems interesting. Though it's like a, a, you know, a combination of science fiction and fiction. By the way, so one thing about the progress in the arts that just came up in my life recently, I gave up playing video games like 15 years ago, and I just started like two months ago, just to try it. I was just curious, and I was like, "The do you play video games at all?" Uh, no, not really. Not recently. Yeah. Did you ever? In your I know life? they have. Oh, yeah. When I was a teenager, I did yeah, a lot. I, did, I know I video did. games have come a long way. I did, I did as well. And I started playing. Uh, first, I played a little bit of Elder Scrolls Online and then Skyrim. And I was like going through this world and I was like, this is like legit literature. Like these guys created oh, yeah. like something that were because I'm making real moral choices. It feels kind of real. And it's in this very robust world. It's like I've read a lot of literature and yes, it's it's there are very important elements of literature that it's missing, like how words can train your consciousness, which I think is absolutely critical. So I'm not saying replace literature like replacing literature or anything like that, but the beauty of the, the things that they've you know that they've created, the moving through the world and that you're making choices, it's like there is an element where it's giving you something that art does give you. And maybe this is part of what progress looks like is that we are living in it and we can't appreciate it right now. And it's, you know, maybe in 50 years or a hundred years, they're going to look back and like, well, that or a thousand years, they're going to look back and like, here's, you know, interaction is art, right? And the way that you interact with the framework created by the artist who helps you see internally what you should be seeing, right? Because I had to make a choice, just, sorry, yeah. real quick. I had to make a choice just recently playing this game. Do I want to join the rebellion in this big, you know, empire that in Skyrim, or do I want to join um, the the empire, right? And and so and you have to like learn, like, well, what what is the sides, like, and you have to talk to people and kind of figure it out. It's like Jesus, this is like reading a complex novel, and like you know what is happening. 
So, yeah, for what it's worth, I think you're right about interaction. I mean, and certainly one thing that happens in art is that new forms of technology open up the potential for new forms of art, right? I mean, cinema could only have been possible for the last little over 100 the, years. This is a technology thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They fit into each other. Um, and so, uh, and with, and now with, essentially with computer technology, there is or has been in recent decades a potential for uh, for interactive fiction, essentially, um, in some way that's more sophisticated than those old, you know, choose your own adventure books uh, that you might remember yeah. from from childhood. Yeah. Um, and I don't, yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's something that hasn't been fully exploited. Um, certainly, I, you know, with the uh, growth of virtual reality systems and people now exploring just beginning to explore what can we do with VR. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a really interesting because now you're telling a visual story like uh like in as in fin- film, but you also but the 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 audience member now has the ability to turn their attention to different, you know, yeah. uh, to different parts of the scene and that's just a really interesting. Now whether that will turn into something as significant for the world as cinema is today, or whether it will just kind of be a a, a fad or a, a gimmick, I don't know. A little hard to see at this point, but yeah, technology I mean, does open up these new interesting avenues. I mean, it's going to be depending on how creators create something that's that people catch on to. Like everyone jokes that the VR thing is going to, you know, hit off if they can put porn in there, right? <laughs> so if you can put porn in there, then it'll pick up and i there is some like evidence of porn in the media realm has been there to pick like that's why vcrs versus Mm. you know is because that's where porn went right and um i know it's crude but it's there's some truth to it where you, you see that where it's like oh well porn went online and that really pushed people to do mp3s and down or whatever i don't know how true that is i definitely think there's money in it and so it goes where the people go and you know, there's, there's that aspect of it. Um, and the, the point I guess I'm trying to make is like the idea of where the progress is, isn't always clear. So yeah. it doesn't ha- like, does it have to be a big, and in the, you know, in the in early face invention, in the early days of film, uh, you know, film was looked down on. Oh, big right. Time. I mean, you know, yeah. serious, serious stock theater brokers wouldn't touch it. Like and, the stock market wouldn't touch it. And 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 the actors who went into it, right. It was seen yeah. as like if you were a serious stage actor, doing serious literature on the stage, right. And then yeah. you went into the talkies. Yeah, that was just seen as like very below you, and, yeah. and definitely not only just below you. Um, I mean, I think there might have been a reciprocal thing in that case because stage actors tended to look terrible when the camera was right in their face so it it tended to bring out only beautiful people because you like when you got a camera right there you gotta look good like, yeah you gotta look good it, like you're you're imperfect i mean look this camera's way over there i look like shit right here like, <laughs> and like if you put it right up in your face it's it's a problem and um so these over the top you yep. know, and, and that was another thing like the over the topness so there, there was there was clashes there. I think like with television and movies, that was definitely true. Where movie makers thought of themselves as high brow, higher brow, and television was low sitcom, crude humor. You know the. Uh, hey, well, in the early days, uh, as I recall, television was all live. So the early, uh, yeah. so the early yeah, television, is- yeah. So the early television the technology. Actually, there was uh, there was no way to record. So television and film were two different ways of getting picture and sound, but they were completely separate. Yeah. So you could point a television camera at something and uh, uh, and broadcast it live, or you could record on film and then play back in a theater. Uh, but those two media really didn't have a way of interacting. Now we take for granted today that all media can be transitioned into all others, but the actual the videotape was not uh, invented until, I think, the 1970s. And so prior to that, if you wanted to have any kind of a tape delay, you literally had to um, take a film of the television and then and then later on a delay, play the, the film onto a screen and point the television camera at the screen. It was the crudest, uh, you know, uh, sort of hookup between those two technologies that you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, so a lot of early television was live, and maybe that 
tended towards the more. Show about the live thing? Pretty sure I could be. Uh, okay. Maybe I'm. I could be no, wrong. I, I don't pretty, know. For pretty sure, sure I, that's how it worked. Yeah. I think there might have been some live stuff for sure. I, I could have swore they could have put some, um, recordings because I I know one of the big things that happened early on. Now I don't know the exact time period, but I thought it was like the late fifties, early sixties was the acquisition of all these movies. And that was a big thing television was into. And one of the mistakes that movie makers made, just like how they you know, did the same thing with Netflix and the streaming wars that are happening now, is one thing they didn't do is they didn't do a good job of pricing their archived content uh. when they were selling it to television. So television acquired it all the cheap, um, now, one thing I do know about television is that they like shut down from like 1 a.m. till like 6 a.m. or something like that. So you would just get static. And, and, and I know that like in the early days. Um, you had to be operating a television broadcast station. Yeah, they, they had a big station. But then eventually as m- money went into it, they were able to put more programs out and they were able to you know, keep it running late at night for these reruns or for, for movies and things like that. And I, don't, I just don't know the time of when that exactly happened. Um, but I know they were able to do movies. On I, I think shows. it's been a long time since I looked into this, but I yeah. think it's, it's possible that the way they did that was they literally mounted the, the film on a projector, oh, play, no way. played that it on a screen possible. and pointed the television camera <laughs> yeah, at the no screen. That and that was awesome. how they broadcast movies. That's possible. Yeah. I don't know. That's because um, it turned out, possible. it turned out to be, it turned out to be uh, a challenge to invent a, a recording medium on, yeah. a, on like magnetic tape that actually could mm. uh, record enough information fast enough to support yeah, and video. Then, and then so it. videotape came along well after That's audio hilarious. tape. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I don't know, but the, the, so the point is that there's a progress of um, areas that we maybe don't appreciate. And we can appreciate, and I, I think maybe we can end on this kind of note, and you could put some, you know, uh, final thoughts out there. Is that So progress is not automatic. I think that's quite clear. It's not, but it's also not clear what progress is in the present moment. So we can easily look back. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Sometimes we can easily look back and say, here's progress. It's clear, right? You got the bronze horse. A couple hundred years later, you got the, you know, the nicer horse, right? You could see this in the statues of humans over time. It's possible. So people living in that time. One of my more popular articles was um, a a kind of alternate uni- universe of if Ayn Rand was born in 1985, and how she would have like when I was born, or, so, or like I think I said eight 1982, but like the idea was she would have ex- adopted and embraced these new technologies because in her time, movies were an extremely new technology. Like she had, she adapt, she, you know, um, fell in love with movies in the teens and twenties when they were silence. She actually trained to be a silent screen actress. And the point I was trying to make was like a lot of times, like today we're very resistant and we, we look down on these and we, we don't embrace them. Ayn Rand was very embracing of this new medium and she was excited about it and the possibilities of it. And I'm still, I think we haven't even touched the skirt surface. I think it's only been like 15, 20 years since we've done this kind of technology, not even really of the kind of mediums that we have. And so we live in this period where we need to appreciate this technology and what we could do with it. And maybe this is the big technology right now. And maybe there's, you know, we should push for other things, but we need to look at like, okay, we are making big progress in this realm and we need to continue that. And the challenge, and this is where I'll kind of end with my uh, shtick, the, the challenge we have is that one of the things this particular thing has brought to us, the in, the technology of the internet particularly, is a torrent, a flood, a, a, an earthwide flood of information that drowns you in a half a second. Like it's so inundating. And so the challenge of our lives today is the problem of choice, I think. Like I'm just thinking about my own life and all of our lives. There's so much you you could choose, you know, not only like who you want to be with, but um, where you want to live 
anywhere on the planet for the most part in any for, for you know there's some restrictions but you can go so many places you don't have to live in expensive california like i probably won't live here forever because it's too expensive um but you can you know you can um create a weird career that's a hodgepodge of different money making endeavors right which is never po- really that possible in the past right that the, in the in the way that it is today where you could like you know make you know Certainly you know possible to a to a broader range to of a people. Broader range of people. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Thank you for helping me out. So my I, that that's my point. It's like we live in this this ish this uh, era where it's very difficult to make these decisions, and that's where we need help as individuals. And I think the help comes one for me for for art, um, and from art, and that's part of my mission at Troubadour Magazine. And I think you know other ways that it can help is that there's so much information about progress and technology and what that is that we can't, we don't know where to start, but that's what people like you and what you're doing is helping people start here. It's, you know, I'm distilling it for you so you can kind of have that. And I think that's the, a big opportunity for the future. Oh, thanks. Um, I agree. I would say uh, technology increases our choices because it, in- it increases what we can do. It increases our powers, and therefore it increases our choices. Um, that makes the task of choosing just that much harder and that much more important. And we need, you know, in a sense, improved psychological and moral technology to help us yeah. navigate uh, those choices. And one thing about the story of progress is I think uh, scientific and technological progress has generally rocketed ahead of psychological and moral uh, progress or, or yeah. technology, quote unquote. So that is one of the, the challenges of our day. And that's one piece that I've kind of put off to the side because I think that's a whole conversation that maybe we can have some other time, but that goes really deep into the subject matter, the the themes and how the artists have executed that, especially in literature. But I do think, you know, Troubadour Magazine, what we do and the Roots of Progress, what you do is very important because one thing I mentioned about this information age is there's infinite, like every poem, ever created is online basically I, i'm like I'm, i know every important poem i should say and there may be some obscure poems i'm sure but for the most part every poem is online every piece of music is online you know i've never seen the david but i've seen it a whole bunch of times i'd love to go see it and i want to one day and that's going to be its own experience but at least i get to see it which you wouldn't have been able to do 100 years ago right yeah absolutely and so but the problem is knowing what to look for how to do it and that's where I hope I come in and people at Troubadour Magazine and same thing with, you know, what you're trying to do with there's, you know, Wikipedia and there's all this information on the internet, but again, distilling it is absolutely critical for us. So yeah. Any last words for people before, uh, you know, before we take off? Uh, no, this has been a great uh, conversation and uh, I'll just, you know, remind people my uh, blog is the roots of progress. It's at rootsofprogress.org. And uh, you can check it out in your however you like to read blogs or subscribe by email. I write about the history of technology and industry and hope you enjoy. I'm putting it on the screen right now. So cool. Go check this out, guys. It's good stuff. And thank you so much, Jason. I'll see you in five seconds when I shut this off. Thank you, Kirk. (laughs) (laughs) All right.